So it's my, col uh, my, my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Fee Wynn, who I first knew as an EP fellow during the last six, which, six months of which he taught me uh, more than I taught him. And um, I've been privileged to work with him over the last few years where he does such a fantastic job uh, in the EP department at the VA. Dr. Wynn. Chairman, for inviting me to speak today. Well, Dr. Bell, don't be disappointed anymore. I'm, you will see some electrogram today. So, <laughs> first, first for everything, first time for everything. Um, did not touch up. Actually, it'll be up in just one Today, I present to you a new technology that's going to possibly transform how we ablate uh, AFib in the EP lab. But um, just like anything else, uh, friends that the country have been known to associated with a lot of um, new things, uh, including trying to chop people's head off in the past. And, but the revolution that I'm going to talk to you about today is peroximal atrial fibrillation ablation. Um, now we become a standard therapy for people who are drug-resistant symptomatic atrial uh, peroximal atrial fibrillation. But 16 years ago, it was an unknown. Um, it started out with... Um, this uh, landmark paper was published in, in New England Journal of Medicine in 1998. It was from the group from France looking at uh, ectopic uh, uh, from somewhere in the atria that initiate atrial fibrillation. The question is where it's coming from. This first group published um, 29, um, and 40, 45 patients with uh, drug resistant peroxide atrial fibrillation that did catheter mapping to figure out where the ectopic premature atrial uh, contraction coming from the initial atrial fibrillation. It was a rev revolution to find, for them to find that most of these foci came from the pulmonary veins. And from that point, they were trying to ablate or get rid of these ectopic foci and show that it was effective in about 50% of our patients. But for them, they mapped to show that it's actually, it's actually a mixed picture because in 29% of patients, there are only one foci from one pulmonary veins. The rest of the population, they have more than one foci in one vein or multiple veins. So this is where the complexity of ablation coming from. So for them, they demonstrate, for instance, you have a sinus beat from the sinus node, generate uh, conducting into the pony vein that you see that's the second spike here. But then the following initiation of the PAC comes from a pony vein. In this case, is right in fear pony veins. And this patient is come from the right superior pony veins. So clearly this evidence shown that the initiation signal come from the pony veins. When they did the 45% uh, of 45 patients, when they mapped, majority of the PAC come from the left superior pony veins and the right superior pony vein, but there are some signal also come and initiate from the inferior pony veins. So the four pony veins accounting for about 94% of the signal that initiate atrial fibrillation. The rest come from either superior vein cava, inferior vein cava, or coronary sinus. So in 38% of patients after the ablation, they successfully suppressed the atrial fibrillation, and at least at eight month follow up, they was um, AFib free. The, follow the following uh, this publication in 2000, about two years later, the question is: even though we can find the foci, the initial atrial fibrillation in the uh, in the electrophysiology lab, and ablate the foci. Some patients continue to have episode atrial fibrillation. The question is, what happened? And it's turned out that when we're in the, in the electrophysiology lab, we only get some of the signal, not all the signal, to initiate atrial fibrillation. So following that, this group, Papone, went ahead and ablated, isolated all the pony veins. Okay, so they, first of all, we tried focal ablation. We're not completely effective. We move on to isolate all the pony veins. 
they use uh, 3D mapping, 26, 26 patients with drug-resistant peroxidase atrial fibrillation. Among them, they have 12, 12 patients that persist in AF. So people have been on atrial fibrillation for at least a year or more. And they've been failed all drug therapy. So using 3D mapping, here's are the pony vein, the superior left, inferior left, superior right, um, in, inferior right pony veins. And basically these are basic substrate mapping tell you that if uh, the red color is scar and all the way up to purple with it normal life tissues. So before what they did was they isolate all the pony veins. They ablate around each of the pony veins, isolated from the the, 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 the atria, um, particularly the left atrium. So clearly the red signal after the ablation is all scar. Okay? So there's no conduction, no connection between the pony vein to the left atrium. So they found great success. As you can see, at nine months follow-up, most of these trials in, in the early days involve very few patients. The follow-up is pretty short. So uh, for nine months follow-up, 85% of patients have no recurrent atrial fibrillation. Of the 85% that have no AFib, 62% on have been taken off all antiarrhythmic drugs, which was a major finding. Okay? Um, they also found that the suppression of atrial fibrillation by doing this procedure isolate the pony veins, all the four pony veins. The efficacy was similar for peroximal, peroximal atrial fibrillation and persistent atrial fibrillation, which is completely a surprise because you would expect a patient who's been in atrial fibrillation chronically for a long time. It will be more difficult uh, to suppress the atrial fibrillation by just ablation alone. Clearly, they have significant periprocedure uh, complications. Up to 4% of patients have pericardial effusion. Some of these patients require pericardial synthesis. The next uh, advancement, uh, so we start out within the pony veins, ablating each of the foci that we can identify. The next step with the pony, we isolate the pony vein irregardless whether they have ectopy or not, all the pony veins. So we, we're moving gradually from pony vein to the left atrium as time goes by. So this is 2004. Rather than saying just isolate pony vein, there's some evidence suggests that the pony vein left atria junction seem to play some role in terms of initiation and maintenance, main, maintenance of atrial fibrillation. So, Wu Yang uh, in the uh, Carl Heinz uh, group, they, they went ahead and isolated not just the pony vein, but the left atria pony vein junction. So they do a wider area of ablation. 41 patients with drug resistant peroxide supermax atrial fibrillation. So these are pony veins, as you can see, they isolate a wider area outside the pony vein that encompass both of the veins on the ipsilateral side. Okay, with the thought that not just the pony vein they're initiating and maintenance of atrial fibrillation, but the, um, the pony vein LA junction that also the tissue in that junction that provide the substrate for maintenance of atrial fibrillation. So the follow up of six months, 76 percent uh, AFib free. So it's clearly it's better than just foci ablation in 1998, which was success rate about 62 percent. Nine of the 10 patients, or 24 percent of patients who had recurrent atrial fibrillation, they undergo the second procedure, and eight of those patients became AFib free after 131 days of follow-up. So if you look, uh, those patients who have first one procedure or two procedures and combine those two groups together, you're talking about 39 patients out of 41 patient completely AFib free. Okay, so this was an amazing finding. Unfortunately, just like anything else, when we do invasive complex ablation, we have complications. 2% with acute pericarditis, 1% with um, pulmonary vein stenosis. So this trial suggests, at least this study suggests that not just pulmonary veins as a source, as a goal for isolation, we need to ablate the PV LA junction also if we can. So this set the stage for what I'm going to discuss with you about the new technology, the new catheter, what we call the NMARC catheter that potentially could make 
or um, um, job a lot easier. As you can see, most of these procedures take about, well, you know, between four and five hours in the electrophysiology lab. And it's, it, it's time consuming, it clearly it requires significant amount of expertise and experience. So the next catheter that's being evaluated right now, that potentially could uh, impact uh, the way we, how efficient we are and how effective we are in terms of treating atrial fibrillation by catheter ablation. As you can see, this is the wide area circumfer uh, circumferential ablation. Each point is the point of ablation, the red dot. And each of these can take between 30 and 60 seconds, depending on how effective delivery of the power to ablate the tissue. And as you can see, these just isolate the pulmonary vein one by cell. Whether you do wide area circumferential, uh, so, so circumferential isolation or you do point by point around each pulmonary vein, you require significant amount of expertise and experience. So this is where the NMOR catheter, the multipolar ir irrigated RF ablation catheter, is a sort of a crescent around catheter that adjustable and deflectable, that's allowed to cannula into a pony vein and implanted at the ostium east pony vein will allow us to ablate without moving the catheter. Therefore, allowed to cut back, cut down the time for each of the procedure and hopefully more effective because as we ablate the catheter hardly moving and the catheter had to be able to move with the heart. So able to cannula a pony vein at the ostium with this catheter would able to improve, at least in the theory that improve our ability to divert the, deliver the power needed and isolate the, pain, uh, the pony vein more effectively. So some of these preliminary data, this is data just published um, in 2014. So these are brand new data coming out associated with this catheter. This catheter only evalu uh, mostly evaluated in U U Europe up to this time. Currently there's a phase three clinical trial for the United States currently being done and it's just enrollment right now. So, but most of these data I'm going to present to you are going to be come from Europe. So uh, in this trial, uh, 40, 43 patients with uh, drug-resistant peroxidant atrial fibrillation, all patients underwent propulsion endoscopy and cerebral MRI looking at possibility of esophagitis because the left atria uh, wall is close in contact with the esophagus, so we ablated the posterior wall. Clearly, we can induce esophagitis, and we want to know whether they have evidence of embolic event. So this is the catheter. We put in the right superior pulmonary vein in this case, and as we can apply, I can see on the left superior on the other side, and we can play between each pole, or we're gonna play each pole is by itself. Clearly, the when you look at um, the uh, the time of the procedure, it takes about two hours. For each of procedure, the RF duration time is clearly cut down from, you know, between about 30 min min minutes to about 20 minutes or so. Um, unfortunately, when to follow up, 33% have evidence of esophagitis, okay, and about 30% have silent cerebral lesion by M M MRI. So this is clearly a concern. Why would be, why would be, seeing this, where well, we don't see with the standard eye catheter ablation that we currently use. Um, but these patients are completely asymptomatic, but still it's a concern uh, for this catheter. The next uh, piece of data coming from 25% uh, 25, uh, 25 consecutive patients, again, using uh, a single transceptor approach. Currently we do tra two transceptors puncture for atrial fibrillation ablation. So clearly it cut down the time that we need to do it's a procedure. All patients have uh, post-procedure cardiac MRI to look for pulmonary vein stenosis. The, uh, there is acutely, uh, there is no evidence that this catheter by using single approach uh, associated with any uh, com communication that we can see so far in this 25 patient. The procedure, uh, the total uh, ablation itself is clearly uh, effective because we are
clearly are able to isolate the, the total 97 percent of 97 pony veins that we're able to uh, can cannulate successfully in about 90 percent of blade, about 97 or 100 percent of the catheter. So clearly, it's effective. Unfortunately, we see the charring. Basically, when we are blade blood and we don't have a lot of irrigation, we can be form charred material on the electrodes. And you see about 12% of 3 out of 25, which is a concern that we, um, that maybe that explained the 33% silent cerebral lesion that we see on MRI. So maybe this is the early signal that we need to be very uh, skeptical that this catheter can be safely uh, employed in the clinical setting. And as we can see here, there's, if you have the overlaps of the electrode between 1 and 2 overlap between 9 and 10, you start seeing charring material. Basically, it, it burns coagulant blood. Um, so that's maybe why we see the, um, the silent ischemic event, uh, lesion on MRI at least. In this publication, they're comparing com uh, conventional RF ablation, point by point ablation, versus the M, the NMR catheter. Uh, clearly, they do in the their, in their experiments for about almost 3,000 versus 25. Um, the procedure time is significantly shorter with the new catheter versus the conventional ablation. The success rate is about the same the floor time is about the same. So clearly this indicated, at least in the early days, we still have to learn how to maneuver the catheter, and that's what I would suspect that over time, as we get more experience, uh, this floor time should be significantly cut down and our procedure time should, realistic, will be uh, less than two hours. So this is uh, the latest Data suggests uh, look at the long term outcome of uh, the using the catheter to ablate um, peroxymal atrial fibrillation. 45% of 45 consecutive patients with direct refractive symptomatic atrial fibrillation. If we look at the outcome for the 18 months, um, clearly it's within the, expect, the, the expected uh, range of efficacy for. Uh, Peroxymal atrial, uh, atrial fibrillation ablation. It's about 80%. Uh, the procedure time, at least for these early, early days, is still significantly shorter than what we expect for the conventional atrial fibrillation ablation. Concern here, once again, the signal of silent ischemic lesion that we saw before. In this, for 45 patients, we see one stroke. So to summarize all, um, to, get, uh, to start out with, currently pulmonary vein ablation is a standard therapy for drug-resistant symptomatic atrial fibrillation. It's effective in majority of patients. However, it is time-consuming and technically challenging, and it requires a certain amount of expertise. The current catheter would be, uh, is, have been shown in, has been in practice for about 10 years, been effective and safe. The question is, is that, sim is that the same thing that we're going to find for the NMAR catheter? And so far in, in the early days, at least in 2015, there, is, there are signals that suggest that this catheter may not be safe. There is currently a U.S. Uh, phase 3 trial for this catheter, and it's been involved about four. 400 patients of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that are resistant to drug therapy and currently being evaluated. And I think as a bigger uh, cohort patient getting being ablated by this catheter, I think the signal for stroke will be clear. And I think even though there are a lot of excitement in terms of shorter procedure time and the efficacy clear, I think the safety of the catheter is going to be a major concern. And in the long term, it may be just that we have to do point by point ablation. And that's have been shown to be the most effective and safe. Thank you.